Now this big candle holder is something that I saw in my head and made sketches of months ago, but I just haven't gotten around to working on it until now. And the reason that I'm working on it now is that I was asked to demonstrate at the Northwest Blacksmithing Association's conference in May, and I thought this would be a wonderful demonstration piece to do at the conference. After making this first one, I've decided that there's no practical way that I can make this at their conference. This took way longer than the six hours that I'll have available at the conference. And this was very power tool intensive. I used every tool I had at my disposal that seemed to fit this project, except for an electric welder. And some of the assembly might have gone a little bit faster if I had used an electric welder. But at the conference, I'm not gonna have a power hammer available. I'm not gonna have all of my other tools available. And doing a live demo, I do a lot more talking to the people at the demo and waiting for a heat, all that kind of stuff. It's not really a practical project for the demonstration. And I know a lot of you don't like watching power hammers, hydraulic presses. You wanna see everything done at the anvil. But if you stick around to the end of the video, I will talk about how I'm going to modify this project so that I can do it at the conference when I don't have the power hammer and the hydraulic press and all those other tools available. And eventually I'll have a video that shows the second version. It may be a month or two before that gets done, but I will do one of those. And while we're talking about conferences, if you haven't already heard, Abana is having their 50th anniversary celebration and blacksmithing conference June 6th through the 9th in Johntown, PA. Should be a wonderful event be really exciting, lots of great demonstration, vendors, all sorts of stuff going on at a big conference like this. Because I'm going to this other conference in May and then have the Rocky Mountain Smiths Conference in July, I'm probably not going to get away to go to the Abana Conference myself. But if you can get to Johnstown in June, I think it would be a wonderful event. And I'll put a link to Abana's site down in the video description. Anyways, let's get started on this. It's a big project. <laughs> This project's going to start with a piece of inch and a quarter square bar. So that's about 30 millimeter square bar. And this is a little over 12 inches long. It's just what I happen to have since this is kind of a prototype and I want to see how big it comes out. Then I can make any future adjustments that I need to if I make another one of these. Have to go buy more material though. So that's about 315 millimeters long. I'm going to come down what would be five inches from the top and mark for my slot punch. My slot punch will be here. This just marks one end of the punch. I'm going to upset the end where it'll attach to the base. The upset is mostly aesthetic. I think it'll give it a little bit more graceful look with that little bit extra mass at the base. Then 
This will have a tenon at the end, so I don't actually need the upset right to the end. So I'm gonna keep it beveled back as I work. That way it'll be easier to put the tenon in in the long run.
Well, my drifted hole looks nice and even, about the size I want. I may refine it a little bit before I get done. And I've got a nice even taper running all the way through the hole. So I'm really happy with the way this is going. Now it's time to work on a crossbar. And I'm going to use three quarter by one and a half for the crossbar, leaving it full size in the center and then tapering it out towards the ends. Probably this is too much material, but that gives me plenty of freedom. I get a nice even taper. Then I can cut it off where I want it based on what it looks like I need. So it's something like 40 by 310 millimeters. Exact sizes don't matter. Make part B fit part A.
The ends of the tenons will ultimately be headed over, but I want to go ahead and thread them so that I can use threaded connections to check everything, make sure it aligns right. That also holds it together while you're doing the rivet head. It makes your life a lot easier in the long run. At the moment, this is a good, tight, shrink fit, and it should stay solid for quite some time. However, there's going to be some more abuse to this as I assemble the base and the candle cups and do anything else I need to do. And I would hate for it to be just a little bit loose and rattly, so I'm going to go ahead and cross pin this. These will be flush rivets that will almost disappear unless you're actually looking for them. It's better to have slightly too much material for these flush rivets and let the head be a little bit proud so you can file it off flush than it is to have them end up a little bit short and not have enough material to fill a hole. With a little heat from the torch, some light hammering and wire brushing, that pretty much camouflages any of the file work that's been done because the rest of this isn't going to be filed. So I didn't want to leave that one spot shiny. This is pretty well ready to assemble, but it needs to go on a base. For the base, I have a piece of half inch plate that's eight inches square. So that's about 25 millimeter by 200 millimeters square, something like that. It's just a nice heavy piece of plate that'll fit in my gas forge so I can get it hot. So I'm gonna lay out a line a half inch from the edge and chisel that in cold so I've got a good reference mark.
I start the bevel face side up with a hammer, but then I flip it over and put the bevel down so that the larger surface of the anvil will leave a cleaner bevel. Just depends on if you want hammer marks or if you want it to be a little bit of a crisp bevel. Power wire brushing while the material is still hot really helps get rid of the scale and leaves a finer finish than just wire brushing by hand or power wire brushing cold, either one. It is important to secure the work. You don't want to fling a hot piece across the shop. Now by threading all of these tenons, it gives me the ability to assemble this and make sure everything's going to go together the way I want it to, and I can take it back apart, fix things if need be, although there's some of this you can fix after it's all tenoned together. But in the end, the threads are really just kind of a temporary clamping system or consumable clamp, if you will, because it stays on there. Not bad. I think I'm pretty happy with that. Now a square base may be a little bit trickier because if this pulls up tight 
not centered and not square with the base, I'm gonna have to do something about that. Also looks like it leans a little. Leans a lot. So either my tenon is a little bit crooked or my base is a little bit off or something. So I think what I will do is heat the base of that threaded tenon and see if I can bend this over a little bit, have to put it back in there. This may take a little bit of fiddling around a little here and a little there to get it right. That may need more heat than that, but we'll see. Yeah, it cools down so fast. I'm pretty happy with it. I will take this back apart and trim the tenon so it's just long enough to get a little bit of a head on. I don't want it to protrude below the base. Well, let's see how this tightens up this time. Yeah, it's pretty good. I don't know if I go one more turn or a quarter turn. Yeah. That's good and tight. And it looks pretty straight. I'm going to finish this with the forge finish. It's a paste wax from Zach over at ZH Fabrication. It's a good substitute for my favorite Johnson's paste wax.
So here is a nice heavy candle holder that's not likely to get knocked off the table. I'm really happy with the way this came out. This is exactly what I had seen in my head and exactly where I wanted to go with this piece. But like anything, it's not absolutely perfect. The pans aren't perfectly flat. You'll notice that I didn't put any kind of a candle cup in these pans. Because this is such a heavy, massive stand, I'm gonna use three inch by four inch tall pillar candles. I think that'll look really good with that. And I'll get some of those before the video's out so you can see what it looks like with the candles in it. But like I said at the beginning of the video, this is way more work than I'm gonna be able to pull off in a six hour demo when I'm talking to the audience and the people that are there to watch. There's a lot of things that distract you so it's not just constant work for six hours. Heck, I've probably recorded 10 hours of video while I was making this candle holder, and I didn't video every single step along the way. There are a lot of things that were kind of repetitive, so I turned the camera off and didn't do that. So I probably have closer to 20 hours of actual work in this. So no way I can do this in a six hour demo. Plus, this was very power tool intensive. I used the hydraulic press, the power hammer a lot for this use the treadle hammer some, and while there's a power hammer available at this demonstration, it's something they've asked me not to rely on too much because it's really loud, it's annoying, it kind of disrupts the demo if you use that a lot. So I need to modify this to something that will work in that environment. So instead of doing the heavy bar with the pierce and the pass-through that involves lots of heavy upsetting, lots of drawing out, just generally a lot of physical work, I'm going to opt for using a layered approach. So maybe a piece of half by one, maybe one and a half. I'll have to think about that. I'm gonna to have to do this all over again to see if this works. But then I'll put a smaller piece on either side of it and that'll give me a little bit of a shadow line that becomes a decorative element in the piece. And maybe that'll be a half inch smaller, quarter inch smaller. I'll just have to see what size material I really like there. Then that central bar, is what does the center column, and the other bars will then get curved out to form the arms. In the middle, they'll be riveted. Right now, I picture doing a slotted hole that is then upset back down to open that and get a nice swell in the side of the bar. I think that'll be the most interesting looking. Maybe some nice decorative rivets to go along with that. We'll just see. I've only got about three weeks to work on that, and I'll probably go ahead and film most of that but I'm not gonna try and post that video before I do the demo. So if you're in the Northwest Blacksmithing Association, hopefully I'll see you there. If not, I will probably do a follow-up video showing the modified approach. And that's really a lot of what this demonstration is going to be about. And a lot of what I try to impart here on the Black Bear Forge YouTube channel, don't get stuck on this required a power hammer, therefore I can't do it. Reimagine the project, figure out another approach to doing it. I can still get the same sort of a look that I'm going for without using the power hammer, using smaller, lighter material and building it up. The goal is to be creative, to be inspired, and then come up with your own design that suits the way you work and the tools that you have in your shop. I want to take a moment and thank my channel members and my Patreon patrons for providing support that help fund the videos here at Black Bear Forge. Channel members get early access to the videos, while Patreon patrons not only get early access, they also get ad-free versions of the video, an occasional behind-the-scenes video, and some other little perks there. But all the videos I make with YouTube in mind are still available right here for free on YouTube. You just have to put up with the ads and the occasional sponsorship. But if you're interested in Patreon, there's a link to it right up here. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.